Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode three of the Andre Hall Show. Today's guest will be a retoucher who's been going at it for over 30 years, retouching for the UEFA Champions League, NASCAR, WWE, Jumanji, Deadpool 2, Harry Potter, even national ad campaigns, and his name is Dennis Dunbar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining me, Mr. Dunbar. And now before we begin, can you just inform the viewers of what retouching actually is? Uh, gosh, retouching. Um, retouching is a process where usually using an application like Photoshop, Actually, almost all of it's done in Photoshop now. But you're taking an image, a photograph or something that's sent to you by a photographer, and you're, you know, uh, doing things to to improve the imperfections, fix whatever the photographer wants uh, for it. It could be anything from uh, lightening lines on people's faces to compositing on new heads, putting the person against a new background. It, also entails uh, color correction and color grading and you know, removing distractions from backgrounds. So it's, it's a pretty wide open uh, description. Well, when I was doing my research, I was actually really surprised to find out that Photoshop was created in 1987. So when you started out in 1991, were you using Photoshop or a different software? Well, Photoshop was actually created like in 1987. Uh, yeah. It was originally... Uh, it was created by the Knoll brothers, John Knoll and Thomas Knoll. Uh, John Knoll uh, was one of the uh, special effects wizards at Industrial Light and Magic. And uh, his brother Thomas is a, is a programmer. And John would talk with Thomas and say, yeah, I really wish we had a tool that could do this or that. Oh, Thomas said, oh, I could do create that. And it was first marketed as uh, Barney Scan, where they uh, software, a software with, that came with a company that made a scanner. And then um, like 1989, I think, Russell uh, Brown, uh, creative director at Adobe, convinced Adobe this was a really good product to uh, invest in. And then ever since then, it's been you know, going gangbusters. I first learned about Photoshop in 1990. And uh, at the time, there was a competing program called Color Studio. And if you're familiar with the program called Painter, uh, that mimics uh, real painting uh, media like brushes and watercolors and things like that, uh, the guys that wrote Painter were the original creators for this program called Color Studio. And at the time, I preferred Color Studio over Photoshop, but the company that was backing Color Studio which was called Letraset, uh, they didn't put money into the development. So it didn't take more than a couple of years or so for Photoshop to bypass Color Studio. And I wound up switching full time to Color Studio by the time, or to Photoshop by the time it was like version two. But I did start off mm -hmm. with version 1.0, whatever, like that. And, and it was, you know, it was a useful program, but like the maximum size of a brush you had was like 64 pixels. Little little tiny pin scrapes, for uh, compare especially compared to images, the resolutions we have these days, where you have like a hundred megapixel uh, cameras giving you three hundred megabyte files, like sixty four pixels, pretty tiny brush. So, so just... you really had to, you had to think of a lot of solutions for things that you know it, there were a lot of workarounds and and uh, things like that. You didn't have layers. Uh, if you applied a color correction to it, it was applied directly to the image. Uh, it wasn't like a layer and you could brush it in where you wanted or, or didn't want it and whatever like that. So, you know, it, it was a lot of creativity and a lot of thinking about how you solve a problem back in those days. The work's gotten a lot easier, but also more fun. They just couldn't keep up with Photoshop. Yeah, well, they, they, they didn't keep up with Photoshop, but, you know, Photoshop is also, you know, developed so much now we're like, good Lord, now we have generative fill. So mm -hmm. I, oh, I, I want to get rid of stuff in the background. You can get rid of it with generative fill instead of like, I need to get in and clone it and paint and find a stock image or something like that. I can mask in and match and whatever. So, so an awful lot of the work's gotten easier, mm -hmm. but clients are also asking us to do more than ever and work yeah. bigger than, so. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I want to, I want to mention that you've made 
some really cool work for some really cool people. Now, could you tell me if there was a moment when a client wanted you to work with them and you were just starstruck that they wanted to work with you? Um, yeah, in, in, in a lot of ways, it's like, wow, look at look at what I get to work on. This is real exciting. And I, I still have that love. Um, uh, yeah, I, I went to an event recently uh, that had a panel event uh, interviewing photographers who shoot for entertainment work, shooting key art, shooting uh, stills on the sets or whatever like that, you know, it, the whole range. And one of the uh, photographers, Sally Montana, seemed like she did some really cool stuff. You know, and then I did a, a workshop the Saturday after that. So at the end of the week, I did a workshop and she was one of the attendees coming to the workshop. And now I get to work with her. Now I'm working with her on some really cool uh, stuff for that. So like, yeah, a lot of times you get starstruck with it. I, I do remember when I first got into working on movie poster stuff, um, back in the beginning, uh, when I was first learning it and working out, I'd worked with a lot of photographers as an assistant, uh, helping carry lights and carry the cameras and set things up and all that. And as I got into uh, being really fascinated with this idea of retouching, I you know got a computer and like, oh, I need to learn how to use it. I need to build uh, some portfolio examples so I, uh, I reached out to the photographers i worked with and offered to do some free work for them one of those guys was a photographer uh, called jp morgan and uh, he was a big advertising photographer at the time and he would shoot these elaborate sets with with flying props and things you know suspended in the air so a lot of the early work for him was like cloning out uh fishing lines and and things like that or adding something like i remember added fire to a guy's tire uh to a guy's tie as he's flying through the air. And one of JP's clients was uh, Roger Corman, who was the king of the B-grade movies. Uh, you know, the original Little Shop of Horrors, Death Race 2000, Jack of the 50-Foot Woman, a lot of low budget, you know, kind of uh, uh, schlocky kind of uh, movies or whatever. But Roger was the king of the stuff. And so many stars got their start working for Roger Corman. Uh, Ron Howard got a start as a director working for him. Um, you know, it's just so many people got their start for him. So uh, one day I got a call from Roger Corman's company, you know, wanting to know if I was interested in, in doing some retouching for them. And my sister was a, is a producer for movies. And I'm like, Maura, who's Roger Corman? She's like, Roger blanking Corman? Oh my God, you working for him? And I'm like, oh wow, I had to learn who he was. So for about 10 years as a freelancer, I did all the retouching work for Roger Corman on his movie posters. And he had a lot of art directors working for him freelance. So they went off to go join bigger ad agencies. And I kind of followed the network for that. So, but that was my first time of getting starstruck, you know, in the very beginning, working for Roger Blank and Corman, like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Well, can you tell me how you got into retouching? Because at the time it seemed like a pretty obscure job. One might say, yes, it it, it was it was. Um, you know, I I had studied engineering in school. Quickly realized I didn't really want to be an engineer, and a friend of mine uh, got me into photography. He was the first person I could relate to that was actually trying to be creative about photographs, and so that got me swept up into this whole thing of like I fell in love with photography, had to pursue it. I dropped out of engineering school, started trying to learn about photography. And that wound up to me getting a job at a place in Hollywood that rented out photo equipment. It was called the Iranus Photographic Rental Service, or PRS. And the great thing about working at PRS was not only were you learning a lot about photography and cameras and all the lighting gear and everything like that, but all the top advertising photographers were coming through there renting regularly. So people from all over the world and famous names would, uh, would come in. Gregory Heisler, who was an icon of advertising photography, so, you know, for so many years would come in regularly and, and you'd wait on him and, and, you know, it was fantastic. So when I left working at PRS, I started working as an assistant for photographers, helping them with their camera gear, holding the, the lights, setting up, you know, carrying gear and all that kind of stuff. And around that time, a uh, newspaper for the photo industry called Photo District News had an article about a big scandal National Geographic had a scandal when they moved the moon using a computer so it fit better in the crop of their cover. 
And everybody is like scandalized by this. We can't trust National Geographic anymore. You know, what can you do? And I thought, well, it actually sounds kind of cool. How could you use a computer to do that? I had a friend, my friend who got me into photography in the beginning, wound up becoming a, a programmer uh, for that. So he was, you know, not doing that kind of work, but it was just kind of, wow. How, how can you do that just using ones and zeros? It sounded really interesting to me. Uh, so that obsession kind of slowly grew as time went on for that. And uh, uh, as I worked with photographers and we kept trying to, you know, solve problems or like that, like, oh, this would be a lot easier if you had a computer that could do it. Uh, I worked with a photographer who did these uh, very elaborate composites by hand in the darkroom. His name was William James Warren. He's still a very close friend. He's 82 now. Uh, and that was how I met my wife. He would do these things by hand in the darkroom. And one day he came up to me like, this is Amy. She's going to teach you how to do the darkroom stuff. So we're compositing. It would take hours and hours and hours and weeks of experimentation to get it right. And I think this would be a lot easier with a computer. So summer of 1990, I kind of like somehow I became obsessed with, I've got to learn about this. I've got to find information. There wasn't an internet at the time. There weren't books on Photoshop or digital imaging. Didn't even have a term for it yet. So I'm using the phone book. I'm calling every lab in town. I'm calling everybody I could think of that might have an answer about it. And I finally uh, came across this guy, Charles James, who ran a digital department at a photo lab called GP Color. It was located in LA here. And uh, Charles was the first person who would share information. And his attitude about it was, the more I share information, the more I'm going to grow customers, which wound up being really great. And Charles was a great mentor for a lot of us. He gave us a lot of us, you know, a chance to learn and, and all that. And, you know, we all became very loyal users of, of his service. He and, a, he and one of the guys he worked with wound up starting their own company called Bauhaus, which I think is still around. I think they're doing high-end printing now, uh, you know, especially black and white fine art printing. But, uh, you know, that, that was kind of how I became obsessed with this, learning about it. And uh, slowly I began to realize the only way I was going to really learn it was to get a computer and to start doing the work. So um, in those days, uh, the computers were a lot more expensive, especially relative for that, because mm -hmm. this was 1990, 91, whatever. So I signed a lease to buy a, uh, to lease a, uh, a wicked two, wicked fast Mac 2FX computer had 600 megabyte hard drive, which was big time bragging rights. If you went to a user group meeting, I had a, a flatbed scanner. I had a, you know, a 19 inch monitor because that was all they had at the time. You know, it was like $50,000 for this lease that I signed. And I thought, oh Lord, what am I going to do? Well, I better learn how to do this. <laughs> so that was how I got my start in it. And it really just kind of came down to something I, I felt completely compelled to do. Like I ha didn't have a choice to not do it. I would, had to do this. And luckily it worked out well following the dream and, and it's built a, a good career and it's got me work on a lot of interesting projects. And 30 some years later, I still love what I do. I'm here on a Saturday afternoon talking with you about it. So I must <laughs> love it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I was looking through your Instagram when I noticed that you post about every day, every other day. So since you're a freelancer, what days do you give yourself off? Um, well, I, I go through batches with, with how well I keep up with Instagram. Sometimes I get busy and I haven't posted something mm. for a month or whatever. So I'm not as regular as I should be. Um, when you're, when you have your own freelance business, you have to treat it like a job. So, you know, I, I had a client that was keeping me really busy, uh, you know, for a good part of the year. Uh, they went through a bunch of layoffs and things like that. So that work dropped off. So the last couple of weeks have been slower, but every morning I was like, got to go get into the office, got to do marketing, got to catch up on accounting, got to find the next job, uh, you know, make new connections. So if you're a freelancer, you have to think of it that way. In, in the very beginning, you're like, oh, you know, it's, just, it's a Wednesday. I don't have any work today. I'll go take the day off. I'll go to the beach or whatever. And you realize you're not going to get a lot more work if that's your attitude. So you have to really think of yourself as a business person and how do I find the next job and all that. So you do have to work in boundaries. Uh, when we, when started my business, 
we had a two bedroom apartment in Santa Monica. So like, okay, I'll use the spare bedroom for, for my office. And the problem with that was, you know, what was really convenient, like didn't have to drive anywhere. Didn't have to commute. Lunch was just walk over to my kitchen and get some food in the refrigerator. You know, it was really easy. It would also be the sort of thing like a Saturday night, be watching a movie with my wife and like, oh yeah, there's this thing I should go do. And then I'd go back in the office, you know, 11 o'clock on a Saturday night and, and do another couple hours of work uh, just because, you know, some ideas struck me. So I was never really off of work and it starts to get kind of draining. When my wife became pregnant with our first daughter, uh, she's now, thir- our daughter's 30 years old now, uh, but when she became pregnant with our, our first daughter, realized we needed that bedroom for for a uh, a bedroom for the baby. So at first I was looking for a bigger apartment, but my wife was seriously into nesting, like, nope, we're not moving anywhere. And then the apartment next door to us became available. So I took that as an office space. And just even though it was next door, at the end of the day, when I locked that door, I was off of work. On a weekend, like, it's Saturday morning, like, you know, I could go do something with the family, whatever, or I could go work. Like, I have to unlock the door. I have to start the computers up. Yeah, no, I'm off work. And that made a huge difference in my mindset about work. So I treated my job as a job every day, trying to keep regular hours, but also give myself regular time off. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, you know, we wound up buying a house and our house, uh, has a garage separated in the backyard. And off of that is a prefabricated unit that I turned into an office. So I still work from home, but I still have that separation. And at night when I close up the office, I lock that back door, I'm off work. If some emergency comes up, I can always you know, run back into the office and, and fire things back up. But I, I do find giving yourself that, that uh, separation really helps you mentally. Because we have to realize this is a marathon. Now, like I mentioned, my uh, uh, a good friend of ours just ran a 50K ultra marathon uh, trail run. You really have to think about life and what you're doing in those terms. It's not a sprint. Run as fast as you can, as hard as you can, because you're going to get, what, a mile or so in, and you're going to run out of gas. And you know, if you approach your business, whatever career you're trying to have, is like 24 hours a day, I'm on work, on work, on work. Within a few months, you're going to be burned out and fried and and you'll have no life. You'll have no health. You, you know, you'll hate what you're doing for that. So you need to find a way to, to pace yourself and to give yourself that separation. It also helps a lot for your body for ergonomically because you need time to get up, let your eyes focus somewhere else. So your eyes, you know, relax your shoulders, your, your neck, everything like that has a chance to relax and reset. So you really have to think about that in terms of, of everything you do, in terms of a life balance between work and, and life. So how long would a project usually take you, on average? Um, it all depends upon the project. Yeah. Uh, one of the uh, photographers I do regular work with, uh, when he's not shooting a job, he's shooting images for his portfolio. And some of his portfolio images take a half hour to do. Some take a couple hours to do. Um, some, uh, you know, like this thing I, I mentioned, uh, starting to work with this uh, photographer, uh, Sally Montana. She does some great stuff. She just sent me 15 images to work on uh, for her for that. So, you know, it looks like they're taking a couple hours a piece. So that's mm-hmm. probably going to be like a week, week and a half or so of, of work for that. Um, some movie poster stuff, um, like, the uh, UEFA things I was working on for Paramount, um, those those were you know like using the same background, and we we're just substituting in uh, new soccer stars. So that would take an hour, two hours, or whatever for one. Uh, but other movie poster things might take a week and a half, two weeks to work on. The Jumanji stuff I worked on uh, was, was several years ago, mm-hmm. and I had. Uh, been called in as a freelancer to work in-house at an ad agency uh, that's here in the Los Angeles area called The Refinery. Great people, love working with The Refinery. Uh, one of their full-time people was off for like six weeks or whatever. It's like, okay, come in and cover for 
I don't even remember the guy's name. I never met him, but you know, come in and cover for Bill for that. So the first day, I was like, okay, we've got these posters for Jumanji. We need you to get started on these. We have five we're going to need to get done. Like, oh, okay, okay, great. Start working really fast. A couple hours later, like, wait, stop. The studio now is making some other decisions. They're asking us to go back and design something else. So we have this other thing for you to work on. And over the course of six weeks, it was constant start, stop, start, stop, start, stop on this one project. They had other stuff for me to work on. So, you know, it kept me busy. But finally, like the last week, like, okay, now go. I got, finally got everybody signed off at now go. And I had a week, you know, the last week to get five posters done and completed and finished. So every job takes on its own nature, its, its own life. And, you know, the work takes what the work takes. It depends so much on, on what they need done. Well, that's going to have to do it for episode three of the Andrew Hall Show. I appreciate you for joining me, Mr. Dunbar. As always, you can go check them out down below in the description, DunbarDigital.com, isn't it? Yes, DunbarDigital.com. DunbarDigital.com. Thanks for watching. See you in episode four.